Great. Well, welcome everyone to the Wednesday, February 24th meeting of the Elgin Group Public Bonjour. Services Board. I hear someone is not on mute, so perhaps we'll uh, just a reminder to everyone mute your line. Um, I'd like to officially call this meeting to order and as secretary administrator of the Elgin PSB, uh, the first board order of business is um, the election of or appointment of chair and vice chair. So at this time, I'd like to ask for either volunteers or nominations for the position of chair of the Elgin Group Police Services Board. Anyone volunteer or nominate someone else? Don't be shy. This is Dan. I will nominate Sally for the chair. Great. Any other nominations or volunteers? Great. Council Martin, do you accept the nomination? I will accept. So can we have a vote or a motion to appoint uh, Sally Martin as the chair of the Elgin Group Police Services Board, moved by Dave Jenkins, seconded by Trudy. Carolyn, can you call the vote? Dan Froze. I do. Ida McCallum. I do. Trudy Canellis. I do. Dave Jenkins. I do. And Councillor Martin. Yes. Great. Um, now we'll go through the same process for the position of vice chair. Any volunteers or nominations for the position of vice chair? I nominate Dave Jenkins. Declined. I'll nominate Ida. <laughs> I nominate Trudy. <laughs> I nominate Ida. She did a great job. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to turn the video off to get on Frozen, so. I apologize. This trying to do everything from home is not easy in Sparta. I don't have good internet access, so. Well, we can still hear you. So um, we did have a nomination of Dave Jenkins, who subsequently declined. And then Ida, um, Dave nominated Ida. Ida, do you accept or decline? I'll accept. I'll Great. accept, yes, yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> so we need a motion to appoint Ida McCollum as the Vice Chair of the Elgin Group Police Services Board, moved by Dave Jenkins, seconded by Trudy Canellis. And Carolyn, can you call the vote? Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Judy Canellis. Yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes, I like this better than I will. I thought I was getting married again. <laughs> and Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero, the motion is carried. Great, so I will turn things back to our chair, Sally Martin, to take over from here. Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you guys for I guess allowing me to do this again, but I wish I had better video. It, it was helping when we had meetings in person. Just let me know if you can't hear me or whatever. I, I think I'm coming through now. Um, we are moving to the adoption of the minutes from the last meeting um, in November, or sorry, October. Was there any errors or omissions in it? If not, I need a mover to adopt those minutes. I'll second. I all right. Tr I sorry. Trudy moved, and I just seconded. Go ahead and call the vote, then, Carolyn. Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. And now uh, we have disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof. Does anyone have any? Seeing none, I will ask then Julie Ganyu to uh, 
Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, which I sit on that piece. So. Thanks, and with your, that you all know. <laughs> with your consent, Madam Chair, I would ask that Carolyn deliver the report. Certainly. So the Ontario government requires that all municipalities prepare and adopt a community safety and well-being plan as outlined in Bill 175, the Safer Ontario Act. And due to the uh, efforts required to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, Ontario government has extended the deadline for municipalities to complete and adopt this plan to July 1st, uh, 2021. So our consultant, Jennifer Kirkham, who's leading the project, has been engaging various community partners and the general public throughout the process. And currently the advisory committee and the coordinating committee are conducting a comprehensive review of the priorities identified by the community partners and the general public, uh, along with the strate strategies and initiatives that are currently underway in our community. So it is anticipated that the insights and ideas shared by community partners and the general public will inform the context of the plan and will identify any gaps in services or resources available in our community. So as well, this information will be used to help build the strategies and actions for the plan. So I believe our um, consultant is preparing a draft plan, which will be reviewed by the coordinating committee. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Do any of you have any questions? We, with the public consultation, I don't know if any of you took part in that, but it, it certainly was um, interesting to see what the public's uh, concepts of, as it sees in the, as you see in the report, what they consider the issues for safety and well-being in our community. No questions or comments. Uh, we need someone to move the acceptance of this report. Ida and Trudy, call the vote, Carolyn. Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero, the motion is carried. Okay, and now we're coming to you, Mike, and your detachment report, quarterly report. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm just wondering if, uh, if we can perhaps mess up your agenda a bit. Uh, I see Acting Chief Superintendent uh, Hamilton is on the call, and I know his time is valuable, so perhaps maybe you could hear from him and then uh, come back to my report. Okay, now that was in closed session, correct? That's correct. So we will have to, we'll have to have a motion to move into closed session, um, and then after that we'll move out again and do the rest of the public meeting. So I need a motion to move into closed. Ida? Seconder? Dave Jenkins. Thank you. I can't see. I can't hear. Sorry. So uh, Ida and Dave, would you call the vote, please? Carolyn? Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum? Yes. Trudy Canellis? Yes. Dave Jenkins? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Five zero. We'll the give, motion is carried. Thank you. We'll give Carolyn a moment to take us off live before we. Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, we're, we'll get, oh, she's got us live already. She's fast. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Julie, I would call on you then to uh, may, propose the motion coming from closed. Certainly. So upon rise and report, be it resolved that the report from Acting Chief Superintendent Terry Hamilton be received and that the chair, vice chair, and Mr. Dave Jenkins and as alternate, Trudy Canellis, be appointed to serve on the hiring committee for the recruitment of the detachment commander. We need, you need a mover? Yes, a please. 
Who's going to move that one, please? I'll move it. Thanks, Dan and, and Ida. I can vote then, Carolyn. Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, Mike, it looks like we're going to have you longer than we originally anticipated. You told us you'd be all done in March. <laughs> but if you're going to hang in for another couple months, right? I'm more than willing to stick around until the right person shows up. Good. And I'll, uh, I'll send a check out uh, as usual for all of your kind comments. I'll have to send one to Chief Hamilton as well. Go ahead, Mike, with your report. Sorry. Okay, uh, sorry, just to give you an idea. I just want to skim through the detachment commander's report because I actually have a PowerPoint presentation uh, that I'm more interested in, in uh, getting into a, a little bit more detail with you. So I'll just go through a couple of points on the detachment commander report and then hopefully I'll share a screen with you here shortly. Uh, so through the first page with the public complaints, uh, after sending that report in, I was able to get the stats they weren't available at the time. Uh, there were two conduct related uh, public complaints during the October to December of 2020 uh, timeframe. Our intelligence-led policing crime abatement uh, program continues uh, with five people in the program, uh, two people charged uh, with a total of 10 charges. So it's nice to have that program back up and running uh, in its previous capacity and we're seeing good results from that. Uh, as far as patrol hours, October to December, 393 hours of uh, cruiser patrol seven hours of foot patrol and 15.5 hours of school patrols. And again, that school patrol area would have been uh, related to back to school initiatives early in the fall. So just want to draw your attention to motor vehicle collision types briefly and those uh, statistics that you were provided. You'll see uh, 2019 to 2020 for fatal motor vehicles, we went from eight to six. And I'll get into much more detail on our fatals uh, after, after I go through these stats. Uh, personal injury, uh, collisions no change and property uh, damage collisions are down 16.9 percent. Just skip now to the uh, the RMS report, uh, the records management system report, uh, which deals with violent crime would be the next category I want to draw your attention to. Uh, we did see a decrease of 31.7 percent in violent offenses this past year. I would describe that as a significant decrease. Uh, Certainly nothing to point to at this point as far as the reason for that. I think most of the things I'll point to today will be COVID related, uh, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily the factor in that case. We did So we had 31.7% drop in assaults. Uh, Mike, over. Yes. Mike, I just wanted to interrupt you for a sec. I ended up it or not, but I got your violent crime that part twice and I didn't get the motor vehicle stuff at all. Okay. The, re the report that we have has your, uh, like it went from your your public complaints and then it went into violent crime and, and then we got the second whole section again. Same thing. So it's missing the motor vehicle uh, page? Yes, it is. Okay, well, I'll, I'll get that sent in so it can be attached for the minutes. Okay, And I'll, and I'll talk you. about uh, that a little bit further. Uh, so as far as property crime, obviously, and we talked about this at our last meeting, uh, we saw a 40.3% decrease in break and enters 2019 uh, to 2020. And again, I'm going to suggest you people were home uh, and that likely kept the break and enter numbers down from last year. But we did see a, a small increase in our theft overs and theft overs would be uh, things of, of higher value than $5,000. So usually vehicles in, in that case. And then just the last thing is for the detached commander report, I'll just point out at the bottom, we had a decrease of 45.9% in uh, vulnerable sector checks. And again, that was due to COVID. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hopefully share the screen. I've kind of got a year end report and some highlights of things that were successes and where we'd like to take things in the new year. So hopefully I can share that with you here. First of all, you can see it, I hope. 
Is everyone good there to see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the first uh, slide that I'll, I'll go to talks about detachment structure. I know this has been shared kind of in a flow chart previously. Uh, nothing has changed as far as our deployment of members. Uh, we continue to have the detachment commander and staff sergeant position along with our detachment sergeant to assist with administrative functions. Uh, we have one detective sergeant, uh, four frontline patrol sergeants, and 28 frontline patrol constables. So these are the officers that are assigned to platoons and work a shift rotation uh, on the front line. Uh, we then have four detective constables and then three detective constables in our community street crime unit that I brag about so much. Uh, so they're they're separate from that and they still work as part of the joint Middlesex Elgin Community Street Crimes Unit. We have three officers assigned to traffic management, two court case managers, a community mobilization officer, our community service officer, who is Troy Carlson currently, emergency response team constables, a constable that's responsible for our property vault. Uh, we currently have four detachment administrative assistants. We just uh, had one retire in December and a replacement come from another detachment. And then we have our three part-time constables as part of our provincial uh, court uh, funded by Central Elgin. And then we also had the use of one part-time constable. Uh, this is a regional part-time constable. There's no additional cost for the board or any of the townships, and we can we can use them uh, for frontline purposes. Any questions about the deployment model? It hasn't changed. Just for those of you who are new on the board, just gives you a breakdown of, of who's actually assigned here. So this brings me to calls for service for a five-year trend. So we've looked at the data to see where our calls are trending. We have been trending up, up until 2020. Uh, our calls for service uh, was reduced. Uh, and I'm not just gonna say because of COVID, there are some other factors that have impacted our uh, calls for service in a positive way. Uh, 2020, as we all know, was pretty for most, but uh, we have sat somewhere in the 13,000 uh, range average for the last five years uh, with a slight trending up and it can be certainly attributed to our population growth uh, that we see in our area. Any questions about the, I'm going to break down for the chair uh, to show how uh, Central Elgin takes their share of it uh, shortly. Uh, this is, you can see how it's broke down throughout the detachment. Uh, this is calls for service specific to last year itself. Oh, uh, Central I'm sorry, Mike. All I'm it's okay. able to see is the Elgin County detachment structure and deployment. I haven't seen any other screen. Has anyone else caught up to the next screen? No. Okay, I don't know what's going. You froze for a while on me as well. I can try going in on the other computer here and see if it'll do anything. Okay. I think everyone is caught up. So uh, you'll be able to appreciate this then by totals. Central Elgin continues to lead the way when it comes to calls for service. Uh, for the detachment area, the, uh, we're at 3881, uh, followed by Malahide at 1448. And we find that most of the other townships uh, are close to each other and it sometimes flips uh, who's ahead of who, but it's usually Central Elgin and then Malahide. We also have the ability to break it down there, as you can see, to Port Stanley, specific Highway 3, uh, calls related to St. Thomas PS and Elmer PS in our area, as well as the Provincial Park in Port Burwell. So those numbers are consistent year over year for the last five years, uh, Central Elgin continues to be the busiest. Dave? Okay. Uh, yeah, Mike, uh, so is Port Stanley an addition to Central Elgin's numbers then? No, it just breaks that down to show us specifically their area. So and I'm actually going to get a little more. Okay. Yeah. And I'm actually going to break down the Port Stanley calls a little further as, as we move through this. Yeah. Okay, I guess we all know to stay out of Port or uh, Central Elgin, eh? <laughs> Sorry, Sally. It's all right. And Mike, I'm going to have to ask you after this if you could forward me this presentation because I'm not getting to see any of it. At least I can hear okay, you. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll have to. You know what I'll do is I'll, I'll scan it and send it as a PDF scan to everybody. Otherwise, it's, it's too big, but I'll, I'll print off the slide deck and send it to everyone so you have it. Thank you, Mike. So going a little further into calls for service. So this is again, based on 2020 calls. This is time of day uh, that we receive our calls. The bulk of the calls are mid afternoon. 
Uh, they start. We start to get busy, obviously, at 8 a.m. You'll see that's about mid graph. It starts to build up uh, from 8 a.m. until roughly 11 o'clock at night, and then it slows down again. The reason I want to show you this is it just it supports our deployment model here at the detachment. So we have uh, officers on every platoon that work a 12 to 12 shift, and they also cover a two to two nights. And that's so we have more staff working when the calls for service are present. And we incur less overtime as a result of that deployment. And it's shown over the last five or six years to reduce our overtime hours by about 3,500 each year by having this deployment. So the, it remains consistent and it's uh, it's like the rest of the world when people are sleeping, it's generally quiet. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that we, and one of the things that we talked about last year was one of the, the strategies that we were looking to reduce calls for service. And when we talk about calls for service, it goes into billable calls for service. So certain calls, as you know, uh, based on our billing, are reactive in nature, and we have those calls that adds to the billing overall. Uh, so the, over, the OPP undertook a strategy at the beginning of this year to reduce our 911 calls for service. So our provincial communication centers have taken upon, have uh, taken the work on there uh, to reduce the calls that are sent forward to frontline officers for responses. And that's uh, things as pocket dials or accidental misdials and 911 calls. As we discussed previously, usually that was two officers responding to those calls. So you can see uh, from uh, 2019 down to 2020, the number is substantial. We're talking 1,120 calls last year uh, to 230 calls that officers uh, had to respond to this year. And those are calls uh, where they're unable to establish through subscriber information that someone's okay, uh, or we're just not able to clear it otherwise. So those officers are required to attend. So as, as we move forward with billing, if, if this number uh, helps reduce the overall calls over a five year period, that will start to impact uh, the billing cycle as well. But again, our billing model is based on those five year averages. So it would take a while to impact. Any questions about those? Another uh, topic that we discussed last year and where the board made a motion to seek assistance from the county and the engineering department was our car deer collisions. Uh, for us, it's always a, a big impact on our calls for service. Uh, it, it's, uh, there is a reduction to 331, but I will suggest to you that that's likely because there were less vehicles on the road this year. Uh, so I think we need to continue with our campaign of, of public information and signage and support from the county uh, to help reduce those those collisions. Uh, from an operational standpoint, as we discussed previously, we now have our collision reporting center here. Uh, so people are uh, allowed to, to bring in their vehicle within 48 hours of the detachment to report those car gear collisions. Again, that frees up proactive patrol time for our officers on the front line. Um, again, there's the, the tie-in with MNR and the seasons and the deers and the population. Um, but really, I, I don't see that trend changing as we appear to be going up right now. This may be hard to see. It does break it down pretty, uh, pretty low in some of those numbers, but I just wanna show you our, our total collisions and the primary causes for those here in Elgin County. So this is some of the information that wasn't in that report. You can see that the biggest cause of collisions in the county is an animal or a wild, what it says wild or domestic, but essentially those are car deer crashes. And this is a five year number that you're looking at here, a five year total. So uh, car deer are still our highest number of collisions in the county, uh, followed by inattentive drivers and lost control. So a lot of times those are weather related or perhaps distracted driving type collisions. Uh, speed too fast for conditions is also a, uh, a weather related uh, crash statistics. So they, they're usually our winter crashes. And then fail to yield right away usually resolves or is the result of an intersection related question. So if someone's on the through road and you're at a stop sign, they have the right of way. So those are our main uh, areas of attention, certainly as we move forward for this year for our uh, traffic enforcement. Uh, the animal collision again remains a bit of a challenge. I'm not sure. Uh, and again, subject to support from the board and ideas, uh, how we come up with even a more aggressive way to campaign uh, to try and reduce our car gear collisions. Uh, the rest will certainly be uh, addressed through our enforcement. Just so you know, Mike, the county did put up more signs and like quite a few more signs they're trying. It's, you know, it's a, it's a tough one. 
It is, and we appreciate that support and the messaging. I think it does help. Uh, and hopefully have that small dip in the number will maybe be attributed to some more signage. Um, I think we still need to keep moving forward in that regard. And again, this is just a, <clears throat> another breakdown of, of collisions uh, just by year, so you can see them. Uh, we still are kind of trending up. So the, the point of that graph is to show you the, the line that we are uh, trending up. Obviously our peak in 2019 was with the large amount of car gear collisions that we had. Uh, we just received a fatal motor vehicle study. Uh, so our, our traffic services in the region uh, looked into our traffic fatals from January 1st, 2015 to June 30th, 2020. And I'm just gonna share some of the key findings with that, not necessarily this entire slide. So over this uh, five year period, we had 35 motor vehicle collisions uh, in the county. So when you compare that to our homicide rate of usually one per year or zero, we're certainly losing, continuing to lose more people on the roadways than we are uh, to criminal means. Uh, there's no necessary pattern for fatal collisions in every month, except for November and the most occurring in December. And I think that's because uh, in 2018 or 19, we had a large number in December. Uh, certainly the weather plays into that as well. Days of the week, it says Sundays and Wednesdays, uh, but again, it's it's not really, uh, doesn't really tell us much. Um, just down to the next red highlight there, the highest number of collisions occurred on the 401. So as you know, uh, in Southwold, we have the 401 running through, uh, all the way through West in our county from there. Uh, and 23% of those five fatals um, have occurred out on the 401. And you'll see a little lower, it says eight of those are, are eight commercial motor vehicles. Uh, I know during the construction, we had a little bit of a spike there as well. Uh, so our plan this year is to conduct uh, numerous focus patrols out on the uh, on the 401 uh, with the use of our motorcycles uh, and because this is an identified pressure here at our detachment we'll also receive some assistance from our highway safety division members in London uh, based on our focus patrol and our obvious need out in the 401 uh, for enforcement and that's related to commercial motor vehicles falling too close inattentive drivers and always speed is a factor out there so now that will be one of our goals this year is to address the, the number of fatals out on the on the highway. Um, just some interesting stats. Males were uh, three times more uh, involved, more, three more times than females. Um, and the only other kind of anomaly in our study was that 24% of our collisions involved drivers 65 years of age and older. And I don't know if that's a demographic that just speaks to our community, uh, but I just thought I should put that in there for, for interest sake. Any questions about that first little page? Uh, this just puts in a, uh, just to show you in a graph on the bottom. Again, anytime I see a graph trending up, it causes me concern. Our fatal injury collisions, as you see below. Uh, and last year, that this stats were collected in June. We had one after that. So 2020 should actually show six. So there is a trend up. Um, so it does cause me uh, some concern and that's will will certainly be our response as far as uh, focus patrols uh, through the year as the as the weather changes. Uh, to break it down to the causal factors and where about uh, where they're taking place, as you'll see, it's in the same uh, categories really as our as our detachment uh, overall NBCs or collisions, um, loss control or inattentive driver. Uh, there's uh, obviously the highest count there other than unknown, where we've unable to determine uh, what the issue is. Two impaired by drug, two impaired by alcohol, uh, and two of them were speed too fast. So uh, certainly inattentive drivers are a big issue. When you break it down by municipality for our, our, our board area, Southwold is the highest, and the reason they're the highest is because the 401, again, runs through a bulk of their area, if not the entire area, if I'm correct. I finally got the screen, Mike. Well, that's good. I'll still send it to you. Okay. It just finally jumped to the fatals. <laughs> well, I'll blame our computer system here. <laughs> so any questions about fatals or our plans or goals uh, for this year? Okay, moving on. Uh, just to kind of uh, dive in a little. Abe was asking about Port Stanley. Uh, so we've identified here when we talk about trends, uh, 
that Fort Stanley, and I mean, I don't have to tell anyone that lives in Elton County, is becoming a really popular beach destination in Southwestern Ontario, if not for uh, quite a larger area uh, outside of Southwestern Ontario. Uh, we certainly saw last year at the end of uh, the COVID restrictions that the beach was packed uh, on the weekends near the end of the summer. And we see as a result, uh, an increase in calls for service in Stanley specifically. So you can see as that trends up, we went from eight, uh, 700 to 830, uh, which I would suggest is, is substantial for one year uh, for that, that small community. Um, this is uh, by month. So you can see obviously in the center, this, um, this graph for some reason puts January and February in the middle of the year, but uh, July, August and September are peak times for sure. July being the, the most busy, but it's, I mean, that is just common sense. It's a beach location and it's very popular. So just to speak to plans and goals for this year, uh, Jeff and I have had many discussions uh, on top of the 401 and the, the traffic issues that we've identified. Uh, we're gonna be conducting uh, a number of focused and directed patrols in Port Stanley for the summer. We're gonna be assigning additional staff to work Saturdays and Sundays, both in the day and night. Uh, we'll increase our foot patrol, our bicycle patrol, and uh, as we discussed last year, we've been able to secure some ATVs, so we're also going to conduct some ATV patrols. And this will be uh, the goal in relation to these patrols will be uh, high enforcement, um, certainly for liquor license offenses, any any observed traffic traffic offenses, and uh, rides and impaired driving enforcement. Those are going to be our goals down there uh, every weekend. Uh, not to say that we're not going to be engaged in the rest of the, the uh, county, but we will have additional staff that we're going to direct to Port Stanley for the weekends uh, to basically send a message that anyone that's coming here from, from outside our area or from our area that they can attend and enjoy, but certainly to do it uh, safely. So we will also continue to have our Marine Patrol uh, out and about this, uh, this summer as well. Just so you know, we actually had to hire several extra bylaw officers this year, and they were extremely busy in Port Stanley as well. Yeah, we, I mean, even the flow, just to add to that, uh, the flow of our officers, the traffic in and out, uh, certainly when the bridge gets open again, as it's scheduled for the, the beginning of June, uh, we know it's going to be busy. Uh, so we're going to try and have a higher presence just to, to make sure that traffic even is flowing as, as good as it can. Mike, is there any, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Anne. I was going to ask, is there any um, plans for work on 401 this year? Like, are they we doing any, because that's where I, I felt a lot of the problems came from. I would agree. I don't think we've, I don't, uh, just Jeff and I looking at each other here, I don't think we've received any notices. Uh, okay. for any reductions or stoppages on the highway this year yet. Yeah. I'm sure that's subject to change, but uh, I know most of it was in relation to them getting the the guard wires or the, the safety wires in uh, last year. Uh, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping there isn't. I, I would agree, Ida, that uh, that did cause us some concern, and I would suggest it did contribute to it, uh, at least one of our fatal crashes out there with the reduction of lanes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just a couple other things to point on uh, that, that will speak to our summer deployment. This is just our auxiliary hours, and I know uh, Inspector Fishley reported these kind of annually to you as well. Uh, as you can see, we only had 127 uh, hours of our auxiliary members assisting here at detachment this past year, and that's because we stood them down for COVID. Um, they all have lives outside of uh, their OPP volunteer duties, so it was uh, prudent, certainly safe on the part of the organizations ask them to stay away during uh, the pandemic. Uh, we're slowly gonna work, uh, hopefully get them back in for our summer events to help us with Port Stanley and other uh, other duties throughout the year. So we look forward to getting them back in. Our unit is still uh, up to staff, so we still have few members. We'll look forward to engaging them a little bit further this year. Just wanted to give you this uh, overtime uh, Quick look at this overtime graph, just to show you that top line. It just shows Mackenzie Meadows land back lane. That's the Caledonia issue that we've been dealing with this past year. And I just wanted to show you that, that the 9,515 hours of overtime 
that Elgin County members work there. Um, so on top of their duties here, uh, that's what they did to assist there. And then obviously other officers had to backfill in here. Uh, certainly before there's any concern, that that's not overtime that this board will be responsible for. Uh, it's part of our provincial responsibility. I just wanted to just put a little bit of, uh, just notice out that how hard our officers did work in spite of everything that was going on here at the attachment, they were still busy working in, in, uh, in Caledonia this past year. So uh, it seems to have come to a, a bit of a conclusion and we're not sending uh, as many people as we were previously, though they are still engaged a little bit at this time. So, uh, and without getting too many of those, those details there, you'll see that these are the main leaders in overtime for the detachment. And most of those involve activities outside of Elgin County. So us supporting other provincial uh, initiatives or needs across the province. And uh, finally, uh, just the criminal record checks. Uh, again, because we were down this year because of COVID um, and currently maintaining the doors are closed and we're only doing for essential workers employment purposes only. So that'll maintain until we get direction otherwise corporately, but uh, otherwise operationally, we still uh, remain 100% operational. And subject to any uh, questions, um, that's all. Thanks. Questions for Mike on any of this? I had to get a picture of Jeff in there at the end, so. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hard to tell uh, with the masks and everything else. <laughs> now I just have to figure out how to stop sharing my screen and we'll be good. There we go. Any questions at all for Mike? It was nice to have that detailed report. I very much appreciate it. And I will look forward to getting a chance to read some of it. I'll send it today. Pardon me? I just said I'll send it today after the meeting. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we need a motion, I assume, to receive from this report. Ida, seconder, Rudy, call the vote, please. Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero. The motion is carried. Thank you. Now we have three items of correspondence. Um, one is this, just the newsletter. Um, do we need to receive and file that, Julie? Or if it depends, if there are comments uh, on any of them, then you should receive it on its own. Otherwise, you could receive all three items at the same time. Okay. Uh, any comments on? I, I obviously the membership. You will be filing that for us. Do we need a motion specifically to file that or can we just do it as one of the three? You can do it as one of three with direction. Okay. The spring conference, um, which of course is going to be virtual again. Um, we need to know, they said early registration is in by the end of March. So if you want to be registered, Julie, I assume it's you they let know or Carolyn? Uh, Carolyn would be great. Okay. And I, I will say we, it was nice to see such a representation at the, uh, the previous meeting, the Zone 6 meeting. Um, it was nice that three of you were able to attend. I wasn't. We had a Central Elgin meeting that day, but I appreciate the fact that you all went. And there was a good turnout, which amazed me. Because that's not been the case, so I'm glad maybe Julie's making a difference there. Any questions on any of those items that you want brought up? If not, I need a motion to um, accept them all and act on the, the one for membership. And if you want to go to the conference, please let Carolyn know. I will make the motion, Sally. Thanks, Dan. And all right, Ida or Dave, they both put their hands up. 
Carolyn, would you call the motion? Vote. Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martins. Yes. Five zero. The motion is carried. Okay. Are there any other items that anyone needs to bring up or new business? We've got Jeff hiding way back there, Mike. We can hardly see him. <laughs> Actually, sorry. I we just have one, it's just a matter of interest, just for an update for the board that Jeff's gonna to provide to everybody. Sorry, I, I kind of concluded with, forgot about him. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just gonna provide a really uh, brief update to our mobile crisis response team program. Uh, I'd be brief, but it's important, I think, for the board to know this is an important program for our communities and um, even for us here in Elgin to, to give us a, a hand when we respond to mental health calls. We had a meeting, um, uh, myself and the inspector had a meeting earlier uh, this morning with uh, CMHA and Elmer Police. Uh, we were finalizing our MOU um, and our training manual as well. Um, we have identified our mental health clinician who will uh, begin training and working with us uh, very shortly. So coming up on March 4th, uh, we will launch our uh, training locally here. Um, that will include Elmer Police and CMHA as well. Uh, we'll be identifying officers within uh, our detachment here who will be uh, trained um, MCERT, which is the Mobile Crisis Response Team, uh, MCERT officers, and they'll work uh, directly with our uh, clinician. Um, the main role will be to uh, respond to calls for service um, that have a mental health aspect to it, and also to uh, follow up um, on mental health calls as well. Uh, so that's March 4th, we'll be doing that training. Um, our clinician will be uh, doing some shadow work with uh, St. Thomas Police and Middlesex OPP who have uh, the MCERT program up and running. Um, the week of March 15th, uh, we'll do an orientation uh, with our uh, mental health clinician, uh, get her used to uh, the detachment and uh, police crews and all that other kind of stuff that, uh, that might be foreign to her. And then ultimately on the week of March 22nd, we hope to become op operational. Um, our MCERT team will be uh, working Monday to Friday, 8 to 4 to start. Um, and that's uh, in line uh, with the calls for service stats that uh, the inspector showed earlier. So that works well. Um, so yeah, just a brief update, but uh, subject to any questions, thanks for your time. Thanks, Jeff. Does anyone have any questions for Jeff? I'm glad to hear about the mental health one proceeding and coming up. That That's, I think, a very important one. Certainly, uh, one of the emphasis in the community safety and well being plan. Questions? Uh, we need a motion to receive and file Jeff's report. Dave and Ida, call the vote. Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero. The motion is carried. When you become a councillor, you lose your first name. <laughs> Just joking. Um, no other bit new business that anyone has. I guess the only thing left to do then would be to determine our next meeting date. Along usually till we meet two months. So it's once a quarter. So, Mike, do you have a recommended time in mind? April? Uh, I would suggest May might be better because uh, sometimes it's hard to get the stats in right at the end of the quarter. So, if we could at least wait till uh, mid to late May, may I guarantee the stats. Sounds great. So I'm assuming Wednesday afternoon in May, and you say mid, so the 19th or 26th? Is that what you're suggesting, Mike, would be best? Yes, that works. What's, what's people's preference? 26th. You prefer the 26th, Dave? 
Yeah, I just deal with Will these interviews that we're scheduled to do be occurring before that? Because you were saying, Mike, it would be a month, two months, and we don't know, maybe, I guess. There's, there's really no guarantee on a date and time. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to, to suggest. So it, it'll either be with me or with a new detachment commander, potentially. Okay. I just checked my calendar. I had something on the 19th, but it's minimal at best. So I can go either date. About the rest of you, what's your preference? I think time is fine for me. I'm good for any time. Both days are good. Okay. Julie, what would your preference be? Um, I'll leave it uh, up to you, Madam Chair. Well, I, I think the week of the 19th is less busy for me and for Julie because we don't have council and county council and all that that week. Whereas the week of the 26th, we have a very full week. So if we could do it the 19th, that would be preferable for me. We can make That's that work. acceptable to everyone at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon again. Maybe we won't have to be virtual. We'll have to see where things are going, <laughs> May. I may have to come into the office and do it just so you don't have me cutting in and out so much. And again, depending on the circumstances, I would extend the invitation again to hold the uh, in-person meetings here if that's the case. Okay, and if it isn't an in-person meeting, I may talk with Julie and I may just come in anyway, just because my internet is too unreliable. I couldn't believe your screen froze on me. <laughs> could hear everything, but I couldn't see any of the report. Okay, so we'll we'll set the meeting next meeting date for the 19th. I assume Carolyn will send out an invitation right away, so that'll get in our calendars. And uh, I guess that's all there is to do, unless anyone has anything else before we ask for adjournment. Okay, if not, I need a motion to adjourn. Moved by Dave, seconded by Trudy, and Ida. <laughs> Call the vote, please. <laughs> Dan Froze. Yes. Ida McCallum. Yes. Trudy Canellis. Yes. yes. Dave Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Five zero. The motion is carried. Thank you all for uh, being here today and for putting up with this lovely. <laughs> virtual meeting again I'm getting tired of them I must admit so um, it will be nice if we can see each other in person again but you never know what May is going to bring so thank you again and uh, we'll hope to see you sometime soon and keep well thanks everyone